Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Spring Semester Liberal Arts Multicultural Forum, where each semester we bring speakers in to discuss issues pertaining to multiculturalism and diversity. I'm Assistant Professor of History and Policy Studies, Dr. Craig Stutman, and I'm here today to introduce uh, Rabbi Lance Sussman, an honorary Del Val trustee, who's the senior rabbi of Reformed Congregation Knesset Israel in Elkins Park, Pennsylvania. He has written numerous books and articles in the field of American Jewish history and has taught at Princeton University, Binghamton University, SUNY, and Hunter College at the City University of New York. Rabbi Sussman is currently working on a book on Jews, Judaism, and law in America. And next fall, he will be teaching a class on world religions that reflects nicely with Rabbi Kraskov's worldview and mission. Um, just a and that'll be here. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. That'll be right here. I should have said that. I have Del Val. That was, that was definitely a mistake. Um, Del Val's founder, Dr. Joseph Kraskoff, was an activist, rabbi, and a tireless advocate for social justice. He purchased a 100-acre farm in Doylestown, Pennsylvania, and arranged for the construction of a small classroom building, employed a faculty of two, and enrolled six students. With this modest start, the National Farm School, now known as Delaware Valley University, came into being. Two years earlier, Kraskov had traveled to Russia in hopes of a personal appear to the Tsar to allow Jews to the right to own land and the opportunity to pursue agriculture, the calling of their ancestors. The Tsar would not see him. Instead, Kraskov spent time with Leo Tolstoy, who advised him to return to America and lead, quote, the tens of thousands from your congested cities to your idle, fertile lands. <coughs> Let's please welcome um, doc Dr. Rabbi Lance Sussman. Thank you, Professor Sudman. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I've been on the board here in an honorary capacity for almost um, 16 years, and I'm always glad and eager to come here. I have to tell you, I'm very impressed that there are this many of you here for a uh, non-credit, non-required activity without any free food. So the fact that there are this many of you here late in the day is, uh, is very, very pleasing to me. And I hope I make it worthwhile for you. Uh, my understanding is um, we have about an hour. Uh, and I'll talk about uh, the life, and thinking, values of Joseph Krauskopf. Uh, as is the assignment, uh, I really don't mind and in fact rather enjoy if there are uh, questions or comments along the way. It's my job to uh, get him from cradle to grave, so we'll proceed mostly chronologically. But if you need a clarification or you don't quite agree, uh, go right ahead and, uh, and ask uh, while we're going. That's just fine. We can have some dialogue. Uh, if you find yourself uh, critical of what I'm doing and you want to share your criticism, I can handle that as long as it's gentle. Don't, don't damage my ego too much, but um, we'll see what we can do. So, um, Joseph Krauskopf, of course, was the, the founder of the farm school. He was the founder of what is now Delaware uh, Valley University, and he really was a, a man of broad vision, a man of global concern, so the, the choice of him as a subject for anything involving um, cultural diversity is, is very, very appropriate. Um, there was a great Jewish philosopher, theologian uh, in the 20th century by the name of Martin Buber, some of you have probably have encountered. Um, he's actually more popular outside of the Jewish community than inside of the Jewish community. But be that as it may, he, he once made the statement that he stood in the house of Judaism and looked out to the world. And I have a, a sense that uh, Joseph Krauskopf was pretty much the, the same way. Uh, although he was rooted as an ordained rabbi in the, the Jewish tradition, uh, he really was a, a global renaissance kind of person uh, and never restricted his activities just to the Jewish community. And even more than that, uh, had an understanding of Judaism in which the, the Jewish person 
um, was meant to serve the rest of humanity, that the purpose of uh, Judaism wasn't just self-serving, but to be of service to all. And when he founded this school, it was sponsored uh, primarily in its, in its early years, not only by the Jewish community, but by his synagogue. It's the same synagogue that I now serve many, many decades later, with the intention of always opening its doors to initially all men, but then it broadened, of all backgrounds. It really didn't matter, although from a, a funding point of view, it started within the Jewish community because that's, that's where he had his, his connections. So he was literally a person who uh, was of the whole world, but rooted himself in, uh, in the uh, tradition of the, of the Jewish people. There's a modern contemporary Jewish novelist by the name of Cynthia Ozick, who's an important writer. Uh, today, and she once made the comment that the shofar, the ram's horn, which is akin to uh, a trumpet, uh, only works when you blow into it from the little end. So if you have some specificity as who you are, an identity, and you can make a huge noise of benefit to all, whereas if you, you blow into the big end of a trumpet or a shofar or any horn, really no noise, just a little hissing comes out at the other end. And again, I think by analogy, it's kind of how Krauskopf worked as a person. His, his feet were inside of the house of Judaism, but his vision, um, it, both intellectual and spiritual, really was for uh, all of, of humanity. So who was this man? I, I don't presume to call him Joe. I don't think anybody ever, I think his mother called him doctor, but it was you know, I think he was probably somewhat formal. He must have been um, relentlessly energetic. He never stopped. He was always on the move, always had uh, five or six different um, projects. He was um, incredibly, almost ridiculously prolific. He was always writing and um, speaking, and this was before the computer and word processing. Uh, in the day, um, rabbis probably wrote their sermons sometime in the middle of the week, uh, memorized them, and then gave them without notes uh, on, on the Jewish Sabbath, or in his case, he actually spoke on Sunday mornings. He spoke generally for over 45 minutes for a sermon. Today, you would never get away with that in the synagogue. There'd be a board meeting and a challenge to um, the rabbi. And then the next day, the sermons would appear on the street, on North Broad Street in Philadelphia, to be sold like, uh, like a newspaper. And as a result of that, we have a huge corpus of his writings. Many of those sermons were bundled uh, into, into books and then sold as books as well. He, he was tremendously productive all of his life. Uh, he wrote endless letters, he wrote, he kept diaries, uh, and much of the source material uh, remains to this day. Uh, Peter's here from the library, and in fact, um, the university here has a pretty healthy collection of uh, Krauskopf papers, so we're able to know a great deal about him. Uh, there is not a full-scale critical biography of him. There is a biography by a person by the name of Blood, of all things, uh, but it's more of what I would call a eulogy. They're words of praise. Um, I know it's considered not kosher uh, on a college campus to refer anybody to Wikipedia, but I will say that the about 4,000-word essay uh, on, on Krauskopf that appears in Wikipedia is pretty good and reliable if you would like to learn a little bit more about him. And the reason I say that with confidence is because I wrote it. You're just not allowed to attribute it to yourself. That's the way that, that system works. So um, if you happen to read Wikipedia like anything, please always have a critical and disbelieving eye. But the sources are generally listed, so 
it can take you somewhere. I hope I didn't just lose my invitation to ever appear here again. <laughs> so, so who was this man? Um, he was born um, in a Polish district of Germany. Polish, Polish district of Germany, <coughs> Ostrowo in Poznan in uh, 1858. Uh, and it's important to say it's a Polish district of Germany because the map of Central Europe has changed constantly over the years. That same area today is part of Western Poland. But when Krauskopf was born, it was part of uh, what becomes Germany. Germany was really very fragmented. It was called the Holy Roman Empire. It had 300 different states in it, and uh, historians like to say that it wasn't holy, it wasn't Roman, and it wasn't an empire. What it was, was German. And in these eastern provinces of Germany, of, uh, of, of the German Empire, they worked very hard to Germanize the local culture. So in a certain sense, he was double minority in his national context. One, by religion, he was Jewish, which was very much a, a minority. And secondly, he was born into that part of eastern Germany that preferred German culture over uh, Polish culture. So that's where he's from, and it's important because it meant that his first language was German. His first language was German as well as a, a Jewish dialect of, of German called Yiddish, which is really a Hebraicized uh, dialect of, of German. Does anybody here know any Yiddish words? What do we know? Nothing you can share in public, right? <laughs> no, I'm trying. My, my parents spoke Yiddish. Your, your parents spoke Yiddish. My grandparents spoke Yiddish. Yeah. So everyone maybe heard oy vey. Yeah. So oy vey means oh whoa. Oh whoa is what oy vey means. Uh, and very often in, in these kind of immigrant languages, what remains in second and third, um, second and third uh, generations are the swear words. <laughs> okay, so ironically, the German word uh, for jeweler um, is schmuck. So I remember the first time I went to Germany and Austria, I saw all these signs, <laughs> cities, schmuck, schmuck. Well, you know, I'm going to be very impolite, please forgive me. In Yiddish, if you call a person a schmuck, you said they're a prick. Okay, so, so the word schmuck is still pretty much around. Kosher, food that's eligible to be eaten, that's actually a Yiddish version of the Hebrew word kasher. So there's still a little bit of, of Yiddish out there, and probably his grandparents spoke Yiddish, but he grew up as a boy uh, in which the school systems, even the Jewish schools, were required to speak German, and that will become very successful in terms of his, uh, important in terms of his success when he comes here to America. So he's born in um, 1858 in uh, a very remote area of uh, East Germany. And in 1872, uh, as, uh, as a young man, uh, as a teenager, uh, decides to come to America to join his older brother. His father had been in the lumber business. Apparently, they had some kind of mill. And that part of Germany, Poland, is very heavily wooded. Uh, so he, he came from a kind of lower middle class uh, family. He had uh, rudimentary education at the time. And like many young Jewish men of that period, uh, chose to come to America to mostly try and, and seek their fortune greater than any possibility they could have experienced in Europe. We don't know a whole lot about his life in Europe. It must have been daunting for him to come at that age to uh, this country. My own mother came to America at the age of um, 13 alone uh, in the 30s to escape Nazism. Uh, she was no longer, as a Jewish girl, allowed to attend any kind of school. They had been thrown out of the 
public schools, and then they were thrown out of the Catholic schools where they went, and then uh, they opened Jewish schools, and the Nazi government shut it down. So at age 13, my grandparents put her on a boat alone to America, and uh, I would say uh, to this day, she's now 90 and still alive, still has psychological scars uh, from, from that uh, experience. And I, I don't know, I'm not a psychoanalyst, and, and he's not around to talk to, but I wonder uh, what the trauma of leaving his family and crossing the ocean and coming to a place where he couldn't speak the language did to him uh, as, uh, as, a, as, a, as a teenager. When he got here, everything went wrong. Everything went wrong. He, he lands uh, on the eastern seaboard. His older brother was here. And uh, in trying to find uh, his brother, starts from the port of Philadelphia and heads north uh, to meet his brother, who must have been working somewhere in the Trenton, Princeton area, uh, only to learn that uh, his brother had been mugged and murdered on the road. So here he was at a tender age in America, not speaking the language all alone. So what, what could he possibly do uh, at that moment? He knew he had um, relatives in Falls River, Massachusetts. So he makes his way to that seaboard community. And um, that's where he will spend the balance of his uh, young school years. He is. Um, very bright, he's precocious, he's eager to learn. Uh, he enrolls himself in an acting program. He uh, is by nature, I would say, spiritual, but there's no synagogue in this town. It was a classic uh, New England New England mill town. It was a boom town, actually, uh, at, the, at the time. I've made it my business to go and, and see the place. Um, but there was no synagogue. Uh, so he sought something that would fulfill uh, him from a spiritual point of view, and he lands in the local Unitarian church. So Unitarianism uh, grows out of the Protestant spectrum of Christianity and actually has somewhat to this day of a little bit of a debate on the inside as to whether or not they see Jesus as part of God or Jesus more as human and they mostly, I would say, believe that there is one God, although there are today pagan elements in uh, Unitarianism as, uh, as well. It's probably the most liberal of all American faiths. I don't know if anybody here attends any kind of Unitarian Universalist church or fellowship, but they tend to be uh, extremely liberal in every um, in every respect. Um, they do not necessarily, for example, have a belief in the afterlife. So I once heard a definition of a Unitarian funeral as all dressed up and nowhere to go. Okay, so he ends up going there, and in addition to school. He begins to learn something about American culture and American spirituality from this Unitarian uh, community that takes him in. And interestingly, at that time, Reform Judaism, the kind of Judaism I practice, which is the most modern or liberal branch in the uh, Judaic spectrum uh, in the United States, was kind of trending in the, in the direction of Unitarianism anyway. He didn't know at the time that that would be consequential for him, but it, reform was kind of headed to Unitarianism in the sense of a very modern approach to religion, a, let's call it, a belief, a light belief in God, and very low on Jewish, on eth the idea of ethnicity. Okay. Nothing really about Jesus as part of the Trinity, so he feels comfortable in that environment. And as a later, as a rabbi, he is as modern and as Unitarian as one could possibly be 
without actually leaving the faith. Uh, I would actually label him as Junitarian. That is, he retained the label as being Jewish, but for all intents and purposes, from a purely religious and theological point of view, had become Unitarian. I've attended and spoken in Unitarian churches, and my biggest takeaway from is they really seem to like to hug each other. There's a lot of hugging that goes on uh, in, in those environments. Well, there was a, a woman in the town of Falls River uh, who took a liking, an appropriate liking, to this young man and saw in him a tremendous amount of talent. Her, her name was Mary Slade. She was the wife of the principal of the high school, and she herself was the writer of Christian hymns. So I think already you're beginning to see that this really is a, a person of the world. He's German-born, he's Jewish, he's going to a Unitarian church, and his benefactor is a devout Protestant Christian woman. And she sees something in this young man who technically, maybe not biologically, but technically in American society is an orphan. He has no real family to um, take care of him. He has no assets um, of his own. Well, Mary Slade, and by the way, some of her hymns are apparently still sung, particularly in congregational style churches in uh, New England, read in the newspaper that a school to train rabbis, the first successful such program in America, opened in Cincinnati, Ohio in 1875. And she made it her business to write to the founding rabbi of that school, whose name was Isaac Mayer Wise, that she had a, a student who would fit the bill that he was Jewish, that he was religiously liberal, that he went to church regularly, and that he belonged to an acting society. So he had a lot of the pieces one needs in order to be clergy. And she wrote a letter of recommendation and introduction about Krauskopf to Rabbi Wise. And the, the famous line from it is, he should be trained as a rabbi at your rabbinic school because, quote, he has all the Christian virtues. And Wise was desperate for students because it's not so easy to recruit young people to go to seminary. Unlike lucrative things like farming, how much are you going to earn as, as clergy? So it's very hard to recruit. And they mostly raided orphanages in those days anyway to get uh, seminary students. So uh, he starts, he's accepted, and he starts the trek out to um, Cincinnati. Uh, Mrs. Slade gave him a couple of coins and a little bit of food to eat because he had nothing else. He had absolutely nothing else um, in this world. And by the time he gets to Cincinnati to check into the school, he was penniless and he was hungry. Okay. Uh, and his whole life at this point depended on support from the rabbinic school. By the time he dies in 1923, he was the rabbi of the largest synagogue in the United States and the founder of a successful agricultural school, the author of numerous books. So in a certain, from a certain point of view, he is um, a remarkable American success story. Uh, he goes through school quite successfully and uh, is ordained in the first class of the Hebrew Union College uh, in the year 1883. Uh, he had not finished high school, so he had to do high school, college, and then seminary, which is post-bachelor's uh, post degree. Um, today, uh, in order to go to most rabbinic schools, including where uh, Krauskopf went, you have to have your four-year degree, and then it's a five-year program uh, to become a rabbi. At the end of the fourth year, you get a master's degree in Hebrew literature, and then you write a thesis, and uh, if everything goes well, you're then ordained as a rabbi at the end of the um, fifth year. So he was in the first class 
He was in the first class. Only four students were ordained. One of them was a guy named Berkowitz. And the two of them, after ordination, had a uh, double couple wedding ceremony. Uh, Krauskopf married Berkowitz's sister. Okay? And they both ended up uh, here in the, in the Philadelphia area. The ordination service, the first major ordination of rabbis in America in the summer of 1883 ended up being very controversial, very, very controversial. Even though it was only four students, it was a big moment for the American Jewish community, which had about 250,000 people at the time. And Jewish dignitaries from all over the country came to Cincinnati the ordination took place, same, same synagogue where mine was, the Plum Street Synagogue. It looks like a Moorish building in downtown Cincinnati. And from there they went to what was called the Highland House, which was a very fine banquet hall on Mount Adams overlooking the Ohio River. And you had the whole elite of the American Jewish community there to celebrate. And what happened next is one of the great faux pas in American Jewish history. The waiters come out and the first course that they serve are oysters. Okay? Now, Judaism has dietary laws. You can read them quickly in the book of Leviticus chapter 11. Seafood is out. It is not allowed. And it is a violation of biblical Judaism to eat oysters, shrimp, lobster, crabs. It's one of the giant sacrifices that our faith community has to make. Okay? And it was a scandal. It was a total scandal to the point where the traditionalists in the community who were there left determined to open a competitive rabbinic school for rabbis who would keep the dietary laws and other aspects that Reform Judaism at that moment happened to reject. Interestingly, the founder of the school, Rabbi Wise, when challenged, why did you serve seafood at this banquet? He said, because we know scientifically they're not prohibited. And everybody said, what are you talking about? Seafood is seafood. He goes, no, I classify them as ocean vegetables, and they are permissible. <laughs> Nobody believed them, okay? So, Krauskopf is uh, ordained. Uh, he is a star student uh, in a class of four. I like to compare it uh, to the first graduating class of West Point, uh, the American Army Academy, West Point, New York, on the Hudson River. Did you know that half of the first class of West Point was Jewish? Half of the class was Jewish. And the other student had a higher GPA. Okay? There were only two cadets that graduated in 1800. So there were four students, and Krauskopf was the most distinguished of these four. He had served as a student rabbi all over the Midwest, and he received uh, a call to serve the Jewish congregation of Kansas City. In those days, it was in Kansas City, Missouri. Now it's Kansas City, Kansas. It's the same synagogue, but they jumped uh, the river. This was a young congregation that was upcoming, and they were interested in having a kind of rising star <coughs> rabbi, and he did not disappoint them. The minute he hit the ground in Kansas City. He became a celebrity. He became involved in all types of social welfare activity in Kansas, dealing with, with the poor, dealing with farming, dealing with prisons. He was literally everywhere. And that became typical of, of Krauskopf wherever he was. He was uh, simply a person who had to be involved in 10 different activities. There was a um, famous uh, rabbi um, by the name of Solomon Schechter who criticized his, one of his contemporaries, Stephen Wise, who was kind of the founder of Zionism in America about 1900, and said, 
The problem with um, Rabbi Wise is he has to have 10 movements a day. And uh, I think that uh, Krauskopf was kind of the same kind of very antsy guy. He starts giving public lectures. Uh, the first set of lectures he gives is on the history of the Jews of Spain. In Spain, there was a golden age of Jews and Muslims uh, way back in the 1100s and 1200s. And I suppose in Krauskopf's mind, uh, he believed America could also be the venue for a golden age of Judaism. And that, that series attracted the press in Kansas City, and they started publishing uh, his lectures. Then he gave another set of lectures, which was much more controversial. He spoke on evolution. Now, the teaching of his rabbinic school at that time was that God created Adam and Eve, and that's how the human race began. Okay? But, what, but Krauskopf had broken company with his teacher, Isaac Mayer Wise, and bought into Darwin's explanation which Rabbi Wise would have said, it's impossible that we're monkeys. We're not monkeys. We're human beings, and we're in the image of God. But he was a modernist, and his sensibilities were modern and scientific and a little bit Unitarian, but still standing in the house of, of Judaism. And this went all over the country, because uh, although it's still somewhat controversial, uh, I think most scientists are on the side of evolution. Then it was very controversial and heretical almost to take the side of, uh, of evolution, but that's what uh, Krauskopf did. He picked up his pen one day and he wrote to the leading Jewish theologian of the country at the time, an older gentleman who was a rabbi with a PhD from a German university by the name of Kaufman Kohler. He would later be Wise's successor in Cincinnati. He said to Kohler, I think that the modern rabbis of America need, need to get together and write a platform as to what they stand for. And Kohler took him up on it, and a group of rabbis met two years later in 1885 in Pittsburgh and issued what was called the Pittsburgh Platform, which is a radical statement of ultra-modern, I would say, Unitarian Judaism. Okay? In fact, the rabbinic school president said to Krauskopf, now that you've declared your declaration of independence from Judaism, what are you going to do? Okay, so it was very radical, and it's out there to this day as kind of a benchmark in the history of modern religion in, uh, in America. Up to now, it was unknown. It was very hard um, tracing down the origin of this. But finally, uh, the, the uh, public library in Kansas City, Missouri, found the document that proved that this was true. In 1887, Reformed Congregation Knesset Israel, here in Philadelphia, sort of down in the, uh, uh, the, uh, the area, Northern Liberties area of the city where the German immigrants uh, were living, sent a delegation out to Kansas City to persuade Joseph Krauskopf to leave Missouri and come to Pennsylvania. It was a congregation of 250 members at the time, and it was a German language only congregation one of the most radically reformed uh, synagogues or temples as they called themselves, their temple in, in German. They had a beautiful building on 6th Street above Brown that, and it was carved in the front in German, their temple. The, the temple, and it had been known locally for its radicalism, it was the only abolitionist synagogue in the United States during the time of the uh, Civil War, and they called Krauskopf to its pulpit for two reasons. One, he was their kind of reform, and two, he could speak both German and English. And the congregation was beginning to transition from being a German-speaking congregation to an English-speaking congregation, and he could do that easily, naturally. Uh, they found that the generation born in this country, even though they offered German in Sunday school, 
as a language wasn't interested. They wanted to speak English and be American, and it felt that Krauskopf could, uh, could help with the transition, which he did. He quickly grew that synagogue of 250 members to over 1,000. And at the time, uh, KI became the largest synagogue in the United States. Today, it is still, uh, by any standards, a large synagogue of about 1,000 families, but it is no longer anywhere near the largest synagogue in this country. Probably the largest synagogue is in D.C. It's called Washington Hebrew, and they have about 3,000 families that belong to that congregation. He did a lot of things. He started, for example, uh, a group called the Society of Knowledge Seekers. And that was an adult education lyceum program that brought people together to learn on an ongoing basis. Out of that grew the Jewish Publication Society, still located in Philadelphia, the first major Jewish press, book, book press, uh, in the United States. He became alarmed during this period that there was a rising number of Jewish immigrants coming to the United States from Tsarist Russia. Poverty, discrimination, violence was pushing Jews out of Russia. And most of them wanted to come to America. Initially, Philadelphia actually encouraged the immigration of Jews to Philadelphia, but later started to push back. Once they were here, they found themselves in dire circumstances. They were living, they were people from little villages from all over the western reaches of, of Russia and Russia controlled Poland. It was really where Krauskopf himself was from, so he felt a cultural connection to these people. But he felt terrible about their living circumstances in the slums of Philadelphia. It was unhealthy. It was violent. The kids were getting themselves into uh, a, lot of, a lot of trouble. Uh, both the boys and the girls were getting themselves in a, a lot of trouble. Uh, eventually, for example, in, in New York, they had a terrible problem in the Jewish community with prostitution because there was so little, uh, so little economic <coughs> opportunity. Uh, girls were subjected to recruitment by uh, prostitution rings. So things were really miserable uh, in the immigrant slums of Philadelphia and he decided he needed to do something about it. And that is the beginning of the story of, of DelVal. He came up with an incredibly bad idea. A terrible, stupid idea. But his nature was, if it was his idea, he would run with it. His idea was that he personally would go to Russia and speak to the Tsar, one of the great potentate rulers of the world, and persuade the Tsar to create agricultural opportunities for Jews in Siberia. And that instead of coming to America and rotting in the slums of this country, Jews would be given the opportunity to go eastward into Russia because the Russians themselves were looking to uh, build up the interior of their empire. So either eastward, south, down toward today the Ukrainian areas of Odessa. And that they would be trained as farmers. And he thought that that would be a great idea. Well, the first problem was Jews were not allowed to go to Russia and, tra and, and travel. They were restricted from going to Russia. Russia was exceedingly anti-Semitic at the time. And he gets together with uh, a friend of his who's the president of Cornell University and the American State Department, and they arrange passage for him. We have his diary. Uh, throughout his life, he always kept notes. You need, I need, maybe you don't need, but I need a magnifying glass to read his wrote teeny little circular uh, letters, and he just packs it in. He wrote about um, his travels and how the, across the Atlantic, and then he got to Denmark, and his passage to St. Petersburg, and he kept writing about how much he missed his wife, uh, Henry Berkowitz's sister, 
which is strange in the sense that this man was constantly traveling around the world and then writing notes to himself that he missed his wife. He didn't put two and two together, so he kept, he kept traveling. So he gets to Russia, and he is, um, he is um, uh, welcomed there by the Minister of the Interior, a guy by the name of Podonevstov. Podonevstov was probably the biggest Jew hater in the Russian government. This man was a flaming uh, anti-Semite. Uh, who had devised a plan accepted by the Tsar that the Jews of Russia would be persecuted, violently persecuted, impoverished, forced into immigration, and to disappear, as he wrote, that one-third should simply disappear. Nobody knows exactly what it meant. And put enough stuff, completely laughed at Krauskopf. Krauskopf didn't give up so easily. 1894. He gets on a train and wait, makes as well a couple makes his way a couple hundred miles south of Moscow to meet with the person who he admires the most in the whole world. Who was the person that Krauskopf admired the most in the whole world? Leo Tolstoy, the great Russian novelist. You know, if you, if you've never read War and Peace, start now. Because if you're 18, by the time you get to 68, you might finish it. I wouldn't start much later than 18. It's fat. It's a thick, thick book. He was the greatest Russian writer of the time. Uh, he was a controversialist. He had all types of ideas about um, Christianity and love and things like this. Well, he had, by that stage in his life, retired to his family's estate. The deep effects of syphilis had not caused him to go crazy, he was farming with the serfs on his uh, estate, and he would take visitors. And Krauskopf made arrangements to go visit Tolstoy in 1894. And he arrives there with a translator, a Jewish grad student from University in St. Petersburg, and we know exactly what takes place. Tolstoy comes out of the field to meet the rabbi. Later, by the way, this is memorialized on a United States postage stamp. And Tolstoy says to him, I'm willing to talk to you, but you have to answer one question from me before I talk to you. And the rabbi said, of course, whatever your question is, I'll be glad to answer. And the question was, Dr. Krauskopf, are you a rabbi? because you love your people or because you love yourself. A lot of clergy, as you know, have a problem with ego containment. Okay? And he wanted to make sure that Krauskopf was a true clergyman, that he had a, a calling. So they had that discussion, and then he asked him, what's your question to me? And Krauskopf said to him, I would like your support for my idea, instead of having Russian Jews immigrate to America and live in the filth of the cities, that Russia start building Jewish agricultural infrastructure and the Jews of Russia could migrate east into Siberia, then the Russians wouldn't have to see them and they would benefit from Jewish agricultural activity. And what did Tolstoy say to Krauskopf? You are a numbskull. You are a total idiot. Nobody wants to live in Siberia. And furthermore, although I, Mr. Tolstoy, might love Jewish people, most Russians hate them. So if you want to help your people, the Jewish people, get them out of Russia. And if you want them to farm, bring them to Pennsylvania, where you live, and let them farm in Pennsylvania. Maybe the Pennsylvania Dutch will accept them more than the Cossacks and the others in Russia. So Krauskopf has other business while he's in Russia. He comes back to America, and as we heard, he is able to buy some land right here or where we're sitting and to, to start the farm school, to start the farm school. The farm school was his answer to urban, pathology and to the Jewish 
poverty brought on by very, very heavy immigration. Okay? He never intended the farm school to be a Jewish institution. He did not create the school to create Jewish farmers. He created the farm school to get poor boys out of the industrial slums of Philadelphia and train them through through experience and science so that they would have uh, practical skills and then they could go live a good, healthy, and productive life. And he turned to his friends at Knesset Israel, his synagogue, which was a very big and very wealthy synagogue already at that time because of his work. They moved away from North 6th Street and they built one of the largest religious structures in all of Philadelphia in 1892. All that's left of it now is the library, which is Rock Hall at Temple University, which was the library of the synagogue. Philadelphia did not yet have a free library system. So he said the synagogue will, buy, will build the library and anybody in Philadelphia can use the, the synagogue's library. That's, like I said, he stands in the house of Judaism and he looks out to uh, the world. So he comes back to Philly, he finds land, Chalfine, Doylestown area, and he starts the school. Two years later, because this man cannot sit still, two years later the Spanish-American War breaks out. And he makes it his business as a volunteer, although he's already a family man with children and all that, to become the Jewish chaplain to the American expeditionary forces in Cuba. And he ends up at the Battle of San Juan Hill. Okay? The Battle of San Juan Hill, uh, where Teddy Roosevelt, Colonel Teddy Roosevelt, had assembled what he called the All-American Brigade. All-American Brigade. The Americans were whipped up into a war fever by the press. They were very eager to fight a war in which southern soldiers and northern soldiers would fight together on the same time. They were so taken by this concept of unity in the ranks of the American military that they forgot to consider the fact that the Spanish army in Cuba had developed machine guns and were sitting in trenches as North and South soldiers would march forward, and they were literally slaughtered by the, uh, the Spanish uh, army there. For his side, Tsar Teddy Roosevelt, wanted to express unity by creating an army unit, a mobile cavalry unit, that had white, black, Native American, Hispanic, Jewish, Catholic. He wanted young men of every possible stripe to be in his unit. So he had a very unusual mix. He had come from a family that was split north and south during the Civil War and believed in putting together uh, one country. And, and Krauskopf was attracted to uh, Teddy Roosevelt. And when the battle was over, terrible Pyrrhic victory for the uh, Americans, they needed to have a memorial service. And each persuasion had their own service. And Krauskopf was the rabbi for the Jewish memorial service. The first soldier who fell at San Juan Hill was a 17-year-old Jewish soldier. So each group, the Protestants, Catholics, and all had their own uh, service. And Roosevelt, T.R.'s philosophy was as the commanding officer, he had to go to each service. So he went to Krauskopf's service. And the rabbi and the future president met one another. Well, Krauskopf was always a visionary. And he stayed in touch with, with Teddy Roosevelt. And it really helped him. Because once you start a college, you need money. You need a lot of money. And the fact of the matter is no matter how much money they can convince you or your parents to pay, tuition is never enough. Colleges need endowments. Colleges need funds, and through TR, Krauskopf begins to make all types of political
connections in the United States, through the American government, through the Department of Agriculture, through the Department of, of Commerce, which he was one of the principal spokesmen for, to bring funding to uh, the college. For the balance of his life, once he comes back from Cuba, uh, Krauss Cuff's two main causes in this world are, first of all, his synagogue. He was very devoted as a preacher and a pastor, and he had the largest synagogue in the country, and the college. Um, the college was on a piece of land that actually, and still is, on a railroad. So if, when Krauskopf came up here on Sundays, he could take the train. For all the years he was alive, the synagogue was decorated every weekend with flowers grown in the college's greenhouses. On one particular Jewish holiday in the fall called Sukkot, they still built the booth in front of the library uh, here, they would have a general communal uh, celebration of the Jewish Harvest Festival. It's kind of a, a pre-version of uh, Thanksgiving. And thousands and thousands of people would come up uh, from Philadelphia to join the great uh, Rabbi uh, Krauskopf here at the college. He had non-denominational services every Sunday, which was required for the students in the earliest generations. There is a little building right next to us here, which was the chapel. It is architecturally designed as a synagogue with an ark to hold Torah scrolls, but in other respects is completely uh, non-denominational. I think over the years the college has kept it uh, as a non-denominational worship space that any, any religious group uh, is invited uh, to use, and I think that's still true to this day. If anybody has $50,000, they need a new roof so, uh, to keep it going. And the, the last thing I want to uh, add is um, his connection to the Jewish people was complicated. Uh, he was given the opportunity uh, to go to the land of Israel just as World War I was breaking out. It was really a very bad time uh, for him to go. He had recently been on a, a trip to Germany and he, he wrote up his whole book about the passion play in Germany and his objections to it, kind of laid the foundation for Jewish-Christian uh, interfaith activity as a result of that book. And he decides to go to Israel because they had just started uh, experimenting there with agriculture, modern agriculture, in addition to the ancient agriculture that was uh, among the Ottomans and the Arabs uh, who were there. There was a new type of Jewish agricultural community at that time called a kibbutz. The kibbutz is a collective farm. In America, I guess at least in the past, we predominantly had family farms. And part of that has to do with the fact that a, a family has the capacity to take care of land for a farm. In the Middle East, the land is very tough. It's often very hilly, um, and it's, it's tiered, it's rocky, there's a limited amount of water, and it takes a village to farm, as opposed to a family. It takes many families. So I, based on socialist influences in Russia, the kibbutz movement starts to form in, uh, in the land of Israel, mostly of Russian Jewish immigrants. Again, people not unlike uh, himself. And he goes there uh, predisposed against Zionism because he, he only believes in America as uh, his national identity, and he, he has a kind of religious experience uh, on the land of Israel, and he connects to all the places where um, he had read about biblical sites and all, uh, so he becomes a defender of uh, Jewish agriculture, specifically Jewish agriculture in Israel, Argentina, and a couple other places, Vineland, New Jersey. Uh, agricultural experimentation was very big in the Jewish community. Comes back to the States and settles in, and eventually is able to build the college up. The first major building here, Pioneer Hall, burns down. It doesn't set him back personally, and he, he moves it forward. And he's still the president of the college when he dies in 1923. So he dies in 23. He was actually uh, at a meeting in Atlantic City when he passes away. And um, as was the custom at the time, but generally is not done 
in the Jewish community, he chose to be cremated. Jew Judaism actually calls for the, the burial of the dead in the ground. Uh, he and his family had a different belief in uh, cremation. He had done a lot of reading about Hinduism and Buddhism, and he wanted to be um, cremated. If you ever would like to visit uh, the grave of Rabbi Krauskopf, he is available for consultation here on the campus. In the library, his, uh, li his personal library has been reassembled, and his office is behind there. I would urge you to go and take a look at all the books he collected. And in the wall, in his office, in an urn, are his cremates. So he's still here. He never left the college that uh, he loved. And if you would like to say a prayer or, or leave a sheaf of wheat or something like that, I'm sure his spirit would be uh, very glad to receive you. In his day, he went from being an orphan, penniless, immigrant Jewish boy to the rabbi of the largest, maybe wealthiest synagogue in the United States. And the founder of a farm school that just in the last year has actually become a university. In 1900, he was the most famous rabbi in the United States. In 2016, the 112 people in this room are about the only people who know anything about him. So I am glad that you were willing to give a whole hour to listen about the life of your founder, Joseph. Krauskopf, and if we have any time left, I'm more than glad to dodge your questions. So, questions. I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions and comments. Um, questions, comments? Yes. Did he ever become a U.S. citizen? He became a U.S. citizen. It was nowhere near regulated not regulated, depending on how you believe what's going on today, as it is today. But he became an American <laughs> citizen, and he was a big patriot. He loved giving speeches to the independents all and all of that. My hunch is he was a Teddy Roosevelt Republican. <laughs> um, other questions or comments? Get other questions or comments? There's one in the back. Yes. Uh, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, HIAS, started in the same period in the 1880s in New York and then spread to the whole country. It's here in, the, uh, in Philadelphia as well. Um, HIAS was, was created to help immigrants who got stuck in processing. That is, they, they got as far as Ellis Island, but then weren't allowed into the United States. And some of them actually died while in quarantine. And then Hyas started off actually as a burial society. And their job was to help uh, immig Jewish immigrants through the process and get them into the United States is on, ongoing. So far as I know, uh, he was not an activist.